a relational approach to ethics and moral education says that the aim of every educational institution and every educational effort must be the maintenance and enhancement of caring. Tonight, I'm going to be asking you to care about something that you may not have thought about before. And as I do, I'm going to engage with you, and I might say something like, audience, are you with me? And if I do, I want to hear you say, yes, I'm with you. So let's give it a shot. Audience, are you with me? Awesome, awesome. And I also want you to know that I'm very glad to be with you all this evening. Being here right now is like a dream come true, and I promise to make the most of it. So with that, about two and a half months ago, I had surgery. I needed to have the surgery because it would improve my quality of life and make it possible for my husband and I, who already have three beautiful kiddos, my stepkiddos, to try for a biological child. I made it through the surgery all right, but after about three days, I developed a fever that I couldn't break. And after it hit 103.1 degrees, we went to the ER, and of course, I was admitted. I had developed an infection that had turned into sepsis. Now, thank God, I had no idea what sepsis was or the survival rates. 30 to 40% chance of death caught early. I just knew that I was really sick. But the thing that stood out to me throughout my entire experience was the quality of my patient care. The doctors and the nurses were awesome. They were kind and patient and caring and willing to do whatever was needed to help me with compassion. And after I was released, I had home health nurses for the next few weeks. So obviously, I had a lot of time to sit and reflect. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking, wow, those nurses were awesome. Nothing like the sadistic witches I remember who used to torture me with vaccine shots. Do you remember those? Of course not. True. But I also got to thinking about my research on compassion fatigue in teachers. Researchers define compassion fatigue as the physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion that comes with working with people who are in constant states of distress or trauma, which is something that first responders do, doctors, nurses, but so do teachers. Did you know that students living in high poverty experience post-traumatic stress disorder at a rate that is three times that of Iraqi war veterans? Imagine all of that trauma and pain entering the classroom on a daily basis. What must that be like to work with, support, serve, teach? You know what, indulge me for a moment here, okay, and close your eyes. Place your feet flat on the floor and take three deep breaths in and out. In and out, in and out. And imagine, if you will, your favorite teacher, and it can be anyone from cradle to career. And think for a moment about why they were your favorite teacher. Were they fun? Were they cool? Did they listen to you? Did they support you? Did they help you? Can you visualize them? Do you have them in your mind? OK, raise your hand if you do and open your eyes. Look around the room. Each of us has been affected positively by a teacher. But have you ever stopped to think about how all that helping and supporting has affected your favorite teacher? Or maybe your not-so-favorite teacher? <laughs> um, I'd like to read a vignette of an interview I conducted with a teacher that, um, during my dissertation research, that is about the toll that all that supporting and helping can have on teachers. This is Amy's story. Amy is a high school math teacher. This last year was one of the roughest years I've ever had. My colleagues and I couldn't wait for the school year to be over. The fires and mudslides just wrecked our city. Some of my students lost all of their belongings, and one student even lost their life. I tried to do what I could to help them, but even now, just talking about this makes me want to cry. Yet, even with all of that in one year, a student committed suicide at the end of the year right before graduation. I remember the administrator interrupting class over the loudspeaker to ask us teachers to read an email that was just sent to us. I did, and it was all I could do to keep from crying. The administrator apologized in the email because they did not know how else to tell us, given that so many students were asking about it and they did not want us to be caught off guard. Then. The administrator got on the loudspeaker again 
and asked us to read the email to the students because rumors were flying like rampant through the school by that time. I read it to my students. I told them that it was a hard letter to read and that I would probably cry, which I did, but I got through it. The student who had died was in the same grade as the students in my class, and so a lot of them knew the student. In the room, it was so heavy with the weight of the silence and pain. We just sat there. Finally, to lighten the load, I just said, well, we are almost done with the lesson. Why don't we just finish it? I had never seen my students so happy to do math as I did in that moment. Now, in this story, you know that the students and teacher had experienced a major trauma firsthand, the wildfires and mudslides. According to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, that's what trauma is, direct personal experience or witnessing an event that is so outside the range of usual human experience that it is extremely distressing, so much so that it can cause serious mental health concerns like post-traumatic stress disorder. But in this story, there is also secondary trauma or indirect experience in that in just knowing about the student's suicide, it caused emotional pain and trauma for every person in that school. But in particular here, I want to focus on the teacher. As long as students are experiencing trauma and teachers are providing physical, mental, and emotional support in response to it, teachers are, in effect, working with trauma victims and experiencing trauma sometimes firsthand, but mostly secondhand on a daily basis. In this way, teachers are like first responders, like those nurses. First on the scene in the face of challenging situations to provide physical and emotional support to trauma victims, their students. Audience, are you with me? Yes. Okay. okay. Now look, I'm not telling you this so that you will feel sorry for teachers. Nothing could be further from the truth. I think teachers are awesome and important, just like the work that all first responders do is awesome and important. First responders carry the weight, safety, and well-being of those that they save and rescue on their shoulders, and teachers provide the basic educational foundation for every child in this country. Nothing can be more noble. The problem I want to talk to you about is this. Teachers are suffering from compassion fatigue, and there are not enough resources available to help them to combat it. Now, as I said, compassion fatigue is the physical, mental, and emotional exhaustion that comes with working with those who are in constant states of distress or trauma. Researcher Barbara Stamm describes it as a combination of burnout and secondary trauma. Left unaddressed, it can cause mental health concerns, and it might look like Anxiety, depression, irritability, inability to shut off thinking about the traumatic experiences of others, especially when you're at home, at night. Some people might start to self-protect and withdraw socially and emotionally from family and friends and colleagues and students. They might become less kind, less patient, less caring, mean even, they might dread going to work, and they might even quit their jobs. In California, we have a huge teacher shortage. According to the Learning Policy Institute, California needed like 30,000 teachers for the 2019-20 school year, but was only on track to produce 12,000. And the teacher shortage is worse in high-poverty schools with the highest population of traumatized students. My research shows that teachers working in high-poverty schools experience higher burnout and secondary traumatic stress than teachers working in low-poverty schools. My research also shows that compassion fatigue is more acute with female teachers and new teachers. Now, to be fair, there are researchers and advocates who are focusing on supporting students who are experiencing trauma, like the work of California's new Surgeon General, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris, and the spotlight on adverse childhood experiences, or ACEs, and the knowledge that, every, or that students of color and students in poverty experience more ACEs than any other group of students, as well as the influx of trauma-informed practices in schools. But none of this support really focuses on the teachers who are serving students. Compassion fatigue in teachers 
Compassion fatigue in educators is not something that is talked about much at all. And it is a grave injustice. I mean, we never send a first responder into battle without the proper gear. And we never let a doctor or a nurse work on a patient without the proper training. And we never send a firefighter in to fight a house fire without the proper training, protective equipment, clothing, or water. But we do send some teachers out on the front lines in the classroom every workday without the proper training and tools needed to work with students who are experiencing trauma or to deal with the natural secondary traumatic stress or mental health issues or concerns that might arise. <laughs> so audience, are you with me? Yeah. All right. So the question is, what do we do about it? Given that 60% of California's 6.2 million students live in poverty, 73% of its teachers are female, and that newer teachers are often the ones hired to work in understaffed high poverty schools, compassion fatigue is a real concern for teachers, and it's only going to get worse if we don't address it. I recommend that we change the way that teachers are prepared and supported at the school, district, county, and state levels. Here are a few examples from my research on how we can do just that. First, let's focus on meaningful training for teachers. And I know the teachers are in the audience going like, Jacqueline, come on, not another training, right? But that's why I said meaningful. So for those who are entering the profession, let's include a course on compassion fatigue, secondary trauma into teacher credentialing programs. The course should describe what it is and how it is measured, symptoms for individuals and organizations, factors that influence susceptibility, strategies to mitigate it, and self-care strategies, like restorative circles for teachers, check-in, check-out processes for staff meetings, or even a simple, hey, how are you doing today? Second, for those already teaching, let's hold professional learning sessions on compassion fatigue. The sessions should cover the same content as the course I just described. Lastly, let's make sure that every teacher has mental health first aid training so that they can learn to recognize the signs of mental health distress in students, learn about ways to help, and know where to go if more support is needed. The National Council on Behavioral Health is a great one, and I hear Lady Gaga's foundation likes it. In my research, I saw that the growing awareness of compassion fatigue as an occupational hazard in the helping professions like social workers, first responders, nurses, resulted in a call for its inclusion into trauma training curriculum, training programs, support programs, and self-care strategies. And seminal trauma researchers like Charles Figley even said that we have an ethical, and I say moral and ethical obligation to inform those working with victims of trauma especially childhood trauma, that their job may negatively affect their mental, mental, physical, and emotional health. Why should it be any different for teachers? Why? So as I wrap up, I just want to leave you with a few final thoughts. The image you are seeing on the screen is the African symbol for Sankofa, which is the notion that the gifts of our past can propel us towards our collective future. And Nancy Duarte in her TEDx talk shared that the future is not a place we go, but rather a place we get to create. So let's take the lessons learned from other helping professions, so social workers, nurses, first responders, and apply them to the teaching profession. I believe that Amy could have benefited from knowing how to handle her students' mental and emotional pain beyond just doing a math lesson. And all of the teachers in my research shared examples of how compassion fatigue and secondary trauma and burnout affected them, because it's real. It's real. You know, tonight, you just heard one story from one teacher. But California has over 300,000 teachers. And the country has over 3.5 million teachers. Imagine, imagine the healing we could facilitate with these few tweaks to the preparation and support of teachers. 
and ultimately students. You know, I am alive today because of all of that awesome patient care and prayers, lots and lots of prayers. But I am also healthy and relatively happy adult because of my healthy, happy, whole teachers. If we want this to be true for the generations of students coming up after us, then I implore you to leave here today and share this research. Talk about it. Advocate for resources. Cite it and implement what you can. Charles Figley talked about compassion fatigue being the cost for caring. Let's make sure in the future we are creating that the cost for compassion fatigue teachers are paying isn't their physical mental, and emotional well-being, because our students need whole teachers. This isn't too much to ask, right? This isn't a cost that we can't cover, right? No. I, for one, look forward to this future. I hope you do, too. Thank you.